Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ann Lin. She's an assistant professor of uh, surgery here in our colorectal division at UCLA. Um, she's an expert in minimally invasive um, colorectal surgery as well as heritable cancer syndromes. And she's going to talk about um, anorectal disorders um, and the role of the surgeon. So this table lists some of the differential diagnoses for patients who might come in with anal rectal complaints. And um, we're going to talk about a few things today, hemorrhoids and fissure, as well as rectal cancer. So as you know, uh, hemorrhoids consist of three main cushions. They're made of specialized, highly vascular tissue, including sinusoids, which are found in the submucosal space. And they contribute to anal continence and account for about 15 to 20 percent of the anal resting pressure. And that's really important be because before I uh, do any operative procedures on patients, I really make them aware of that. There are patients who come in with fecal incontinence or minimal leakage, and after hemorrhoidectomy, excisional hemorrhoidectomy in particular, these patients will then complain of incontinence, so that's a really important point. The internal hemorrhoids are insensate. They're covered by columnar epithelium, so uh, they're amenable to office-based procedures. The external hemorrhoids are sensate and covered by squamous epithelium. Uh, these need to be taken care of, usually in the operating room. So it's important to get a very uh, accurate history and then to perform a thorough examination. Internal hemorrhoids are classified according to whether or not they prolapse. Grade one hemorrhoids do not prolapse. Grade two prolapse upon defecation, but reduce spontaneously. Grade three hemorrhoids prolapse upon defecation and must be reduced manually. Grade four hemorrhoids are prolapse and cannot be reduced manually. And the management is really based on uh, the uh, degree of prolapse. Um, the mainstay of uh, therapy would be dietary, usually, and then progressing to banding, injection, hemorrhoid, injection sclerotherapy, followed by hemorrhoidectomy. And we'll talk about each one of these. The management also depends on whether or not, as I mentioned previously, these hemorrhoids are external versus internal, and whether or not the patients have symptoms. A lot of patients have hemorrhoids. Over uh, past a certain age, most patients have hemorrhoids, but we really want to tailor the therapy to whether or not the patients are having significant discomfort, most often uh, pain or bleeding. Fiber is really the mainstay, and I spend a lot of time counseling patients about fiber um, before I proceed with any sort of um, other interventions. I find that most patients aren't taking fiber the right way. I mean, they'll have tried fiber maybe once, gotten constipated, and then don't want to take it ever again. So um, I counsel them to increase their fluid intake slowly by usually one eight-ounce glass per day weekly, um, up until approximately 64 ounces per day, and then to then slowly start supplementing with fiber, increasing by one scoop per day weekly. And I find that in general, this sort of slow regimen um, tends to um, uh, cr um, help my patients improve to the point where um, other interventions aren't really necessary. It's also um, important for the patients to assess their stool for bulk and minimal fragmentation. And additionally, this um, fiber supplementation really becomes the mainstay of prevention of new hemorrhoids from forming should we decide to proceed with invasive treatment. Um, I counsel my patients a lot about avoiding straining by improving bulk and limiting fragmentation and limiting their time on the toilet and no reading. And I was really disturbed to find that they have these toilet potties now with an iPad um, attached to it to encourage kids to, you know, stay on the toilet for a long period of time while they're potty training. So, you know, lots of future business for me, I guess, but... Um, so fiber supplementation is, um, works well for bleeding. Um, there have been randomized controlled trials that have shown that it leads to improvement. It works as well for irritation or pruritus. Um, there have been really no randomized trials to support use of anusol or preparation H 
Um, and so I tend to ask my patients to refrain from using those. It's okay for an acute flare, um, but not for prolonged use. In fact, some patients actually come to me with um, irritation um, from use, overuse of these medications. So let's talk about minimally invasive procedures. I'm going to focus on rubber band ligation and sclerotherapy, but there are other procedures that are available, including uh, coagulation and then Doppler-guided hemorrhoidal artery ligation. Rubber band ligation um, was uh, started in the 1960s. It's appropriate for grades 1, 2, and 3 internal hemorrhoids, and we identify the hemorrhoid through the anoscope. And then a clamp is used to retract the tissue at the apex of the hemorrhoidal complex. We want to be sure we're proximal to the dentate line so the patients don't complain about pain. And then a single or double elastic band is fired. And this uh, tissue sloughs off in about five to seven days and leaves a small ulcer which heals and then fixes the tissue to the underlying sphincter. Rubber band ligation, in this study, um, pain occurred in approximately 8% of patients. Um, there was no uh, report of thrombosis in this study, but that can occur. Bleeding can occur, so we want to avoid it in patients who are using aspirin or platelet-altering drugs. Um, the most um, severe and, uh, but fortunately, infrequent uh, complication is a perineal or pelvic sepsis. This is something that I tell my patients about. Uh, it's characterized by a triad of pain, fever, and urinary retention. We want to avoid this procedure thus in immunocompromised patients. Um, these patients with pelvic sepsis may need to be admitted to the hospital for observation. They may need to go to an intensive care unit, have um, IV antibiotics for treatment, and actually go to the operating room for debridement. So it's, it's a very serious complication. Um, I prefer to ban one or two hemorrhoidal columns and then wait approximately four weeks between sessions. Um, the recurrence rate can be as high as 68% at four to five years follow-up, but the symptoms do respond to repeat ligation. Rubber band ligation compared to sclerotherapy or infrared coagulation caused lower recurrence, sorry, resulted in lower recurrence rate, um, but more pain. And rubber band ligation compared to hemorrhoidectomy may resulted in less pain, fewer complications, less time off work, but lower long-term cure. So let's talk about sclerotherapy. It's best for grades one and two. We, there's a variety of sclerosing agents which can be used. And we inject about two to three cc's of, it, of the sclerosin into the submucosa of each hemorrhoidal bundle, approximately one centimeter proximal to the dentate line. And this creates fibrosis, scarring, shrinkage, and fixation of the hemorrhoid. And it can be used in patients on anticoagulation. Sclerotherapy improved or cured 90% um, of patients who had been uh, initially treated with medical therapy in this study. Um, although a randomized controlled trial showed no difference in bleeding rates at six months between sclerotherapy with fiber versus fiber alone. Complications are similar to rubber band ligation, and the recurrence rates are usually a little bit higher than uh, rubber band ligation. Regarding external hemorrhoids, um, patients with acute thrombosis, uh, the indications for surgery would be symptoms that last uh, for uh, uh, fewer than 72 hours, uh, the patient's inability to tolerate pain if there is erosion of the blood clot, and circumferential thrombosis and necrosis. We usually want to um, defer excision for patients who've had pain for over 72 hours. Um, as the uh, pain from the excision is actually usually worse than just watchful waiting. And um, so these patients are advised to perform sit spats, they, they get pain medication, stool softeners, and um, are placed on fiber supplementation. Uh, for patients who qualify for excision, we want to be sure that we excise the entire area and don't just evacuate the clot because clots can reform. Um, let's move on to hemorrhoids, external hemorrhoids or in internal hemorrhoids that require um, excisional hemorrhoidectomy or the procedure for prolapsed hemorrhoids. So for excisional hemorrhoidectomy, the tissue is dissected away from the sphincter muscles and then the base is suture ligated. And we usually want to preserve a one centimeter area of anal derm between the hemorrhoidal columns to avoid anal canal stenosis. 
Um, for strangulated hemorrhoids, um, an open hemorrhoidectomy could be performed, but oftentimes what works well, if, if these can be reduced, we can actually defer hemorrhoidectomy um, as um, hemorrhoidectomy in, in this state with the hemorrhoids so inflamed and strangulated um, oftentimes requires the uh, removal of a lot of tissue and um, so stricturing can occur. So pain is usually uh, universal and when I tell my patients that they may have pain for five to seven days they typically, most patients will want to try the conservative route and, um, you know, schedule a return visit when they're really sure that they want to undergo the procedure. Um, there have been a lot of studies uh, looking at what, what um, options besides narco narcotics can help patients um, recover well, including use of topical deltaism or um, injection of Botox. Um, the complications include urinary retention, uh, urinary tract infection, bleeding, stenosis, infection, and incontinence. Um, briefly about procedure for prolapsed hemorrhoids or stapled hemorrhoidopexy, um, we place a purse string suture uh, three to five centimeters above the dentate line, and then the circular stapler is fired. Um, the internal and external hemorrhoids are repositioned to their anatomical positions. So some patients with external hemorrhoids who have this procedure are not satisfied because uh, the ex external hemorrhoids are not removed. So some patients still note this and um, don't like the procedure. The 12, uh, 12 randomized controlled trials comparing the two of them showed that uh, conventional hemorrhoidectomy was more effective in preventing long-term recurrence of hemorrhoids, but the numbers are low in terms of recurrence. So this is just a summary slide. Okay, so let's move on to anal fissure. So um, an anal fissure is a tear in the anal derm, distal to dentate line, and most commonly occurs in the midline. Posterior tends to be greater than anterior. And if there's a lateral fissure, you want to suspect other causes. And these can include Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, syphilis, tuberculosis, leukemia, cancer, or HIV. So once the tear occurs, it begins a cycle leading to repeated injury. And the pain causes the exposed internal sphincter muscle beneath the tear to go into spasm, resulting in decreased blood flow, local ischemia, and leading to poor healing. This is a picture of an acute fissure and then a chronic fissure where there's a sentinel pile and a hypertrophic anal papilla. Very classic. Um, the pain is described as a paper cut, uh, sharp, pain associated with bowel movements, patients can see bleeding, they can have pruritus and or skin irritation. And uh, the three components of medical therapy include relaxation of the internal sphincter, um, institution and maintenance of atraumatic passage of stool, and pain relief. <clears throat> so fiber uh, is important. And with conservative therapy, almost half of acute fissures will heal. The management options um, include sphincter relaxants. Um, so these include nitroglycerin or calcium channel blockers or Botox injection. And then surgical treatment include lateral internal sphincterotomy and anal rectal advancement flap. So nitroglycerin relaxes the smooth muscle. It's better than placebo in healing of fissures, but um, the major side effect is headache, which occurs to 20 to 30 percent of patients. And I, I typically don't prescribe this at all because I don't think the patients are compliant. Diltaism, uh, I usually start with this. It um, causes healing in about 65 to 75 percent of fissures. There are no significant side effects, and um, uh, six out of 10 patients will uh, heal. Um, usually after eight weeks of treatment, um, and then the great thing is that when patients are still uh, having symptoms after eight weeks, I give them another eight weeks of treatment, and the majority of those patients will heal. Um, in this study, six of seven patients were successfully treated with a second course. Um, if they don't heal with the deltaism, then we proceed with Botox uh, treatment. We usually have to document 12 weeks of treatment with uh, deltaism before the insurance company will pay for it. Um, we inject this into the internal sphincter. Um, it causes temporary paralysis of the internal anal sphincter, 
and decreases the resting pressures for two to three months. It causes successful healing in 70% of patients. Um, and side effects um, are mainly transient of incontinence to flatus. There are patients who will have um, incontinence to liquids or solids, but that's rare. And um, patients with recurrent fissure may respond to repeat injection. Lateral internal sphincterotomy uh, involves dividing the internal sphincter from the intersphincter groove to the top of the fissure, and it heals 95% of chronic fissures. The complications of fecal incontinence are minor, um, but it can occur um, after in more patients. And I think with uh, limited sphincterotomy, the numbers are much better now. So uh, the open technique involves making an incision, a radial incision um, of the lateral anal derm over the intersphincteric groove, and then we do a limited division of the internal sphincter only up to the proximal extent of the fissure. And I think the reports previously of um, higher rates of fecal incontinence were um, from a time when we used to divide more aggressively and we would take a lot more of the uh, sphincter muscle. An anal advancement flap is an alternative for patients where the risk of incontinence is high, and we advance the skin into the anal canal to cover the ulcer. So the algorithm is fiber, increased fluid intake, diltiazem cream, we evaluate in six to eight weeks. If non-healing, I repeat the cream for another six to eight weeks. If non-healing, Botox injection, and then um, if non-healing, repeat Botox injection versus the sphincterotomy or anal advancement flap. Okay, so rectal cancer. Um, the principles are a good preoperative evaluation with either endorectal ultrasound or MRI. We want to make sure there's no distant disease with a CT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis and obtain a CEA level. After the ultrasound staging, I, I ask our colleagues to tattoo um, the tumor at the distal edge um, because usually in two quadrants, particularly for patients who undergo neoadjuvant chemoradiation and have tumor downstaging. Um, sometimes it's really difficult to find um, that area of ulceration, uh, particularly for someone who's had great downstaging. I think it's important um, for it, it's very helpful to know exactly where the cancer is. And sometimes just distance from the anal verge is not as um, easy to uh, reproduce or, uh, and so the location of the cancer in relation to the rectal valves is really helpful. Um, here's a picture of um, the rectal valves and so here's the first rectal valve here and the second rectal valve and this is the dentate line. And you can see here there's tattoo um, just distal to the tumor, which is more proximal here. I find that that's really helpful um, in addition to location from the anal verge or uh, description of it in relation to the um, you know, digital rectal examination or the top of the sphincter comp complex. Um, there are a couple of uh, things that colorectal surgeons need to do to be sure that we have uh, decreased, lo uh, improved local control, and that's a total mesorectal excision um, with good circumferential radial margins. We want to be sure that the mesorectum is intact. Um, also, for patients who have advanced stage cancers, we pre-treat with chemoradiation, and that can reduce the local recurrence by 50%. So in the past, we used to do uh, total mesorectal excision surgery using open, low anterior resection. Um, now we've moved towards um, robotic uh, or laparoscopic low anterior resection, and also single incision uh, laparoscopic uh, low anterior resection. And the incisions are getting smaller. Um, mortality and morbidity um, are as listed um, more, most frequently, um, urinary sexual dysfunction or wound complications. We've, um, for rectal polypoid lesions or early T1 rectal cancers, um, we've uh, moved from open to a combination of either laparoscopic assisted endoscopy or endoscopy assisted laparoscopy. Um, we've used transanal excision in the past. Um, EMR is also an option. 
Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about transanal endoscopic microsurgery or a transanal uh, minimally invasive surgery. So um, the tumors that are characteristics that fav favor local treatment. So this is an early rectal cancer. These are the ones that are, uh, or a polyp. Um, so these are mobile. They're usually less than four centimeters in diameter. For cancers, we want them to be well to moderately differentiated, to have no vascular lymphatic invasion, and to have less than an SM3 level. I prefer to just focus on the patients with SM1 level of invasion. Um, and we've, the results, the studies comparing TEM to transanal excision report better results with trans anal endoscopic microsurgery. There's uh, less local recurrence. Um, studies looking at TEM versus uh, low anterior resection have noted um, equivalent survival rates and local recurrence rates. Uh, the mortality or morbidity is as listed, and uh, intraperitoneal entry when adequately closed is not associated with increased complications. We've used transanal excision and TEM in the past. Um, more recently, TAMIS um, is a newer option for, T, for patients with T1 or rectal polyps. Um, the uses a gel point path transanal access platform. Uh, the setup time is uh, less than one minute. Uh, the patients can be placed either in the prone position or the lithotomy position, and the laparoscopic instruments are already in the hospital. And I just want to play a short 30-second clip if... So this is a patient who had a polyp that was noted um, the at about 10 centimeters from the anal verge. The um, biopsy showed uh, tubulovillus adenoma, and um, this is a patient who has the, is, uh, has the gel point path in place in the rectum. Uh, the rectum's been insufflated, and um, uh, the surgeon is using a harmonic instrument um, to excise the lesion. And um, this, the lesion would be closed um, using sutures in the standard fashion as we would uh, laparoscopically intra-abdominally. And I think we can stop there because of our time constraints. Thank you.